Hello, person watching this video. Go buy the f***ing merch. Now, <laughs> hey, what's going on, guys? This is the second channel where I do things like talk about the main channel. For example, my recent upload talking about Perfect Blue, a psychological thriller that came out in, what the f*** was it, 97? I was actually kind of hesitant doing this video, to be honest, because I'd watched Perfect Blue, and I was like, oh, wow, I really like that, and I actually want to talk about that, but uh, it's always that weird hesitancy where it's like, you know, when I feel like I'm not going to be able to be as f***ing jokey and haha -ha and dicks, it gave me a bit of, mm, do people give a fuck about this? I don't know, but people do give a fuck about it. Literally, this was one of those videos where the entire, like, first batch of comments opposed from being like, yo, thanks for the upload, GG, yo, we love you, or like, yo, you fucking so handsome and shit, that's the usual shit. They were like, yo, I can't believe you're reviewing Perfect Blue, this is fucking sick, yo, this is my favorite fucking movie, dude, you fucking snap with this one, baby, go off. It was more so that, which was nice. It seems like you guys were fucking with this one, I'm glad. Let's read some comments. VH Squid said, rest in peace, Satoshi Khan. Perfect Blue is one of my favorite animated movies, but Khan himself was an icon who died way too young. Between Akira and Paprika, this dude was a master of his craft, and it's tragic that we'll never get the chance to see more from him. Truly, he was one of the greatest creative minds the film industry has ever seen. I, I honestly didn't even know he passed. I didn't do too much research on him himself, but since then, people have told me more titles like Akira to check out. So I, I would not doubt it whatsoever. I was even suggested Paprika 2 as well. How old was he when he passed? 46, 46. Yes, in incredibly, incredibly young. That sucks. RIP Satoshi Khan, big time. Ash Martinez said, throwing in my two cents on theories. Okay, let's hear this one. I'm, I'm already I'm already on the edge of my seat. I always assume that when Dream Mima is performing on the stage and the crowd is cheering, I actually think Rumi is the one performing on stage. For one, we already know a lot of the times when we see Dream Mima interacting with the real world in some way, it's because of Rumi's influence. Parentheses, sending the emails, keeping up with Mima's room, etc. Secondly, we already know that Rumi is near the Cham concert, or was at least there earlier in the day by the fact she walked in on the conversation between the other two Cham members. Lastly, Rumi was already previously an idol. It would not be at all odd if there were people in the crowd who were fans of Rumi when she was still a star and got excited to see a kind of guest star in the performance. It would also explain why the other two Cham members are visibly uncomfortable if someone just ran on stage in the middle of their performance. Just my thoughts, though. See, this is my problem with that. I totally toyed around with this idea. I was like, you know, it's... It's Rumi. She's up there because she said she was going to be up there and she just ended up fucking taking her spot because the crowd reacts and is surprised at first and then they all cheer, which means it was something fucking fire. Rat face, tears of joy. He's like, oh my God, my world is back. I'm sure he saw Dream Mima or he saw a Mima. He might have seen Rumi, but my only problem with that theory is it's not mentioned. It's never mentioned again. And I feel like even if the movie's trying to fuck with us, it would really, really be fucking with us if it's just never mentioned by anybody. There's no scene where the Cham members are like, what the fuck was Rumi doing? There's no one from the crowd. Like we always hear this specific group of dudes in the crowd. They're always kind of public opinion. Th that's what they kind of represent. And we always get them randomly saying shit. They didn't say anything like, yo, what the fuck was this person doing up there? Like I would understand if that scene is strictly supposed to be from Ratface's point of view, because I believe he thinks he saw Mima. I think that's the truth. But I think with nothing else there, it's just, I don't know. It's it's like I can't I can't disprove either of us and I can't prove either of us. You know, it's just kind of whatever 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 side of that you want to sit on. That one I would love to have a concrete answer on. King Cat Mushroom said, During the kill of photographer, there is a cut to a traditional Japanese mask. No. These masks are used in Japan theater productions, so a single actor can wear multiple masks, allowing them to play a range of characters. And that's why we see Mima as the one killing the photographer, because Rumi is symbolically wearing a mask of Mima's face. Ah, interesting. I did not know that at all. Definitely missed the cultural aspect on that. That's cool. Sad Souls said, I don't know how on the nose this actually might be, but another fun thing to note is that purity is very important in, in idol culture. No alcohol or smoking, no sex, no relationships, and so on. This is also why the scene in the movie and the photo shoot are so impactful and frowned upon by not only Rumi, but also Cham and the fans. It's more than just out of character. It's something that actively makes it impossible for Mima to return to being a pop star idol super on the nose but but yeah definitely her trying so desperately to leave the pop star image because the fucking screenwriter just wasn't using her because like she's a pop star what the fuck is she gonna do in this show they were like okay well we're gonna give you the fucking hard right turn because you're giving us the green light all right she's gonna do the super fucking provocative scene clearly make news 
in a situation like that, the public isn't going to respond with like, oh, she's taking her actress career so seriously that she's willing to do this really fucking tough scene. It's like, no, what the fuck? Like, what? Everyone's going to be like, yo, what the fuck are you doing now? And we've seen it time and time again. Miley Cyrus being fucking Hannah Montana. And then she started doing all this shit where people were like, who the fuck is this? What is Miley doing? And she got so much scrutiny for it. I, I don't think it'd be so far-fetched to think that that's that was her just trying so desperately to murder this fucking cute Disney girl fucking outlook of, oh, I'm this who, hoopsie daisy oopsie boo boo. And it's like, no, I mean, this is who the fuck I am and this is who I want to be for the rest of my career. So, you know, just so you know, shit is real over here. Stop thinking about Hannah Montana, you know? Maybe, maybe good analogy, maybe dog shit analogy. We move on. A Shu said in the Japanese dub, Mima's voice in the end was actually Rumi's voice. So it could be another twist that Mima was the one hospitalized while Rumi became what she wanted, her idealized Mima. Oh, like Mima, for example, like maybe Mima was actually hit by that car or just maybe some point beforehand. Yeah, I, I guess I wouldn't understand that. That one wouldn't make too much sense to me personally, because then I'd have like 50,000 more questions past that point. And I think that would be a difficult stance to defend. Theories are theories, right? It's just a game theory. But yeah, I, I don't think I could defend that one. Fluffcake says something to notice is that Ratface and Rumi are based on two real people, Ricardo Lopez and Yolanda Saldivar. Ricardo was the infamous Bjork stalker, and he recorded various tapes obsessing over her in a very unhealthy and creepy way, and how he wanted to spend the rest of his life with her. The final few tapes infamous for him being angry over her having a relationship he didn't approve of and sending her a bomb and also recording a suicide. With Yolanda, she was a president of famous singer Selena Quintanilla's fan club and manager of her boutiques, who was removed from both positions after it was found she took the money from the organizations. Selena was unfortunately killed by her the morning after Selena's family confronted her. Perfect Blue is one of my favorite movies ever, as being one of the best films made by the genius Satoshi Khan, and also shows a perfect illustration of the dark side of becoming a star and how nowadays that can happen to us. I'm curious how you know this. Was this, I'm assuming this was said by the director at some point? Let me read before I say stupid shit that comes out of my mouth. Yeah, okay, so it was based on a novel. Now, I'm assuming they did some tweaks? Because saying based on the novel doesn't really mean much. Selena died what? Press in 95. And this movie came out in 97. What about the Bjork stalker? He died in 96. I feel... Uh, you probably know better because you're fucking... You're saying this with some confidence. So I'm over here trying to discredit you. I guess I'm just surprised that something happening in 95 and 96 would be so quickly covered by a movie that was released in 97. I mean, it was released in 97, right? Yeah, 97. What are the comments on this? Perfect Blue didn't get inspiration from the real events of Ricardo Lopez. The similarities are coincidence and only prove further that Perfect Blue is more real than initially thought. A literal prediction of what is to come. They have nothing to do with each other. Unfortunately, Satoshi Khan has has never made public statements about his characters being based on anyone that's your own speculation. Not like how you can clearly state Black Swan is inspired by Perfect Blue factually. Okay, Fluffcake, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know where you got that from. I would disagree, but if you can scrounge up some sort of source on that, go banana crazy. My source is that I made it the fuck up. Bob Todd said, if you love Perfect Blue, look up the other titles by Satoshi Khan. He passed from cancer in 2010, and there's only five that he directed, and a few more where he was involved. They are all super good, by far one of my top anime directors slash writers. I love Perfect Blue, I would not hesitate to do that, and I definitely plan to. Confusion and Creation said, I am thrilled that you decided to cover one of my favorite movies and you absolutely did it justice. That means a lot, thank you. Some quick remarks. It's awesome that you caught that subtle hint at Rumi's background as a pop idol. It took me at least four watches before I caught that one. It pissed me off so much because I was just like, oh, she's just she's just crazy. And she just fucking wanted to be, she wanted the fame. I don't know. And it wasn't until I kept watching it because since I was watching the fucking sub version, if you happen to look away from the screen for a little bit, you might miss a line, you know? And even when, you, when you're fucking looking at it, you still might miss a line. This took me not my first watch to fucking do that but glad I caught it. I love that the movie actually has an uplifting ending. They could have had Mima descend into madness and ultimately die tragically, but I think that having her conquering her struggles with her identity did a lot more for the message of the movie. Yeah, no, I, I like I like the ending too. Speaking of which, I think the message is beautiful and very interesting. To me, the message mostly boils down to, you'll never live up to the avatar you create for yourself in public. You're not as perfect as the mask you put on. You never will be. No one is entitled to that perfect version of you and you shouldn't feel forced to live up to it either. You'll never be perfect, but you can be you and that's enough. The movie is still super relevant and with the Japanese pop idol industry still involving new ways it's important to remember this movie for what it is a biting criticism of the way that the industry creates and glorifies these completely unrealistic avatars lastly shout out to the soundtrack virtual mima is one of the most haunting tracks ever created absolutely masterful anyway love you gg looking forward to the next video thank you confusion for that comment and yes the soundtrack is great and i'm happy i was able to incorporate it in certain parts of the review spider is said an interesting thing i learned from a documentary on satoshi khan was the actress voice 
actually Mima in the Japanese version used to be an idol and also had a stalker similar to Ratface when she was a singer. She didn't know if Khan knew this when she was cast in the role, but I think it adds another layer to the movie. You should also check out Paprika since you enjoyed this. Interesting. I obviously did not know that. Sarah Kay said, I love how sincere you are when you're reviewing movies you genuinely enjoyed. Your Exorcist review is awesome and this is awesome. Find more you like and talk about them. Hey, if that's the case, I'm more than happy to do that. Obviously, the plan A is usually, let me look at this fucking piece of shit. Why are you looking at the camera? And talk about how much of a piece of shit it is. I mean, I, I, I like doing it too. I love making the Exorcist review and I love making this review too. Uh, plague, plague, plaguey in the house. Getting it done. The pop star scene might have been Mima coming back as a surprise to everyone. A sort of celebration for making the charts since she couldn't do it earlier and wasn't able to talk to them. Or alternatively, Rumi in costume and making a surprise appearance. The rest of Cam looked just as shocked and slightly unnerved by Dream Mima, which we've established is Rumi. And it would probably be weird for the girls if their former friend and member's manager came in costume to dance and sing like she knew all the routines and songs. But it could also just be a mindfuck. Which, speaking of, I have a theory that a lot of this movie's skips and mindfucks are equally Mima's. And that during the first scene with Mima and Rumi, Rumi might have slipped something in Mima's tea that made her hallucinate. But it's been a while since I watched it, so I could be wrong on that one. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, trying to figure out Mima's actual timeline when everything's happening, I think is a fucking chore. I'm assuming we're seeing the same timeline she's experiencing because she has the same confusion and questions we do but at the same time there's other parts where she very much reacts like she was going about her day and then there was the next day so i don't know i, I think it's a little dib and dab to make it fun for the audience and also still have it make sense but yeah as far as the pop star mima thing i mean i i feel like you could really throw any of those theories in there like maybe mima fucking just didn't know what the fuck was happening and she jumped on stage it would make more sense for people to react positively to mima than it would be Rumi. People saw Room in there. Sure, she's an ex-pop star idol, but they'd also be like, what the fuck are you doing? The people in the audience that represent like public opinion that spoke beforehand, they were the ones talking about how they read Mima's Room and they were like, Mima said that she was going to make a guest appearance tonight. So it's very possible that more people read about Mima's Room for them to then see that statement from apparently Mima come to fruition would make perfect sense for all of them to be like, yo, let's fucking go. And it would also still make sense for her fucking pop fucking what you call them the fucking friends from the pop group be like why are you here but then that also just fucking makes it weird because there's no acknowledgement of anything so we're left with fucking nothing from that scene because there's no confirmation it's possible i missed it i would have loved i loved if i missed it because then someone could just fucking tell me but no we don't get anything on that one so our minds just wander the medicated artist said, I went into Perfect Blue completely blind. All I knew that it was an insane psychological thriller and I came out a completely different person when the credits rolled. It rewarded the audience for watching it more than once, which I absolutely adored. Yes, absolutely. fucking lutely That is the truth. You cannot watch that movie once. Unless you're fucking goaded with the sauce. <laughs> no, I, 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 I had to watch it more than once for sure, for sure. So Angelica Figueroa says, I won't read her whole thing, but she also brings up it possibly being Rumi. And she says that the other onstage members of Cham were professionals and went with it. So maybe they didn't talk about it. The audience reacted and said nothing because maybe they enjoyed it in the moment and laughed at Rumi later on a different blog since all we ever see is Mima's room. So who's to say there wasn't a blog like Fat Hack does the chunk shuffle in an attempt to be Mima? We're only shown the movie through two perspectives. Mima, who wasn't tech savvy until shown, and Rumi, who had this specific Mima bubble that she built for herself. That's what I get out of the scene. Yeah, I don't think Cham speaks after that point. When Mima pulls up to the radio show that Cham is doing, I think that's the last time we see the Cham members. And they don't really say anything because they're talking to each other like on a podcast type fucking thing. But I feel like even Talokoro would say something, though, because he'd be like, what, what the fuck did Rumi do? She was on stage? Like, I feel like, if anything, that would get to him. And he'd immediately be like, what, R Rumi? Like, what, what the fuck are you doing? It just doesn't make sense. Like, for the characters and everybody always having something to say about fucking something. How did no one mention Rumi, not Mima, fucking was on stage going... Da -da -da -ba -da 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 -da. There's, like, little things that support that theory, too. Because, like, even at the end when Rumi is singing to Mima, she clearly knows the songs. She probably definitely knows the routines. So if someone was going to try and, me and mesh in with the stage, she would be the one to do it. I still can't land on a side. I think right now I'm leaning towards us just being fucked with a bit. But I also think that's kind of a fun thing, too. That I don't have all the answers. And I don't want to have all the answers. Thank you, Perfect Blue, for being a very enjoyable watch. That's going to be that there. Like the video, subscribe, and as always, buy the fucking merch. I am out.